So, I know some of you came in here today expecting to hear a good joke, because that's why some of us show up, right? Or a bad joke, you know, but, and I didn't want to disappoint you. I didn't want you to feel like, you know, you got cheated or something. So, you know, I, I looked and looked and looked to find something, you know, that would really be good. Well, not too good, but kind of good. So I, I heard about this highway patrolman who's sitting on the side of the highway and he's running radar waiting to catch speeding drivers and he sees a car putting along at 22 miles an hour and he looks at his radar gun and he said, that can't be right. He says, well, that car is driving so slow, it's just as dangerous as somebody who's driving, you know, really fast. He, I need to take care of this. So he turns on his lights and he goes and he, he pulls the driver over and he walks up to the car. He notices that there's five old ladies sitting in the car, two in the front seat, three in the back seat, and, and their eyes are as wide open, they're, they're as white as ghosts, and the driver's kind of confused. He says, um, she says, officer, the, the, the driver says, I don't understand. I was doing exactly the speed limit. What was the problem? And the officer says, ma'am, you weren't speeding, but you should know that driving slower than the speed limit can also be a danger to other drivers. And she says, slower than the speed limit? No, sir, I was doing the speed limit exactly, 22 miles an hour. And the old woman was really proud about that. And so the officer, you know, he's trying not to laugh. He's like, ma'am, you know, 22 is the root number you were on. That wasn't the speed limit, okay? So the woman gets a little bit embarrassed and, you know, she grins, she thanks the officer for helping her with her error. And, he says, one thing before I go, um, I have to ask, is everybody else in this car all right? Because these women look really shaken. They're, you know, they're white. They haven't said a word this whole time. You know, what's, what's the deal? And she says, oh, they'll be all right in a minute, uh, officer. We just got off Route 119. <laughs> Give you just a minute here. All right. So the youth this week just got done logging a lot of highway miles. Okay, they, they hit the road, um, and I'm so proud of them for putting feet to the gospel, for going out and, and, and working and sharing the truth of God's word. And, and uh, unfortunately, you know, my name is Mark Schneider, by the way, and I am the, the new youth pastor, um, and I was not able to go because I had made a work commitment back in, you know, April, May, or I'm sorry, probably April or March before I knew anything about this youth thing. And, and uh, so I, you know, one of the big things I want to teach the kids and tell the kids is that when you make a commitment, you've got to honor that. You've got to honor that responsibility. Um, and so I wasn't able to go, but you know what? I'm so thankful actually that I wasn't because Kelly has been absolutely amazing in this transition, and I knew that he absolutely had all of this under control, and because I wasn't able to go, my awesome wife, Jaren, was able to go, and we had a ton of girls on the trip, and I saw some really crazy videos of a lot of fun that they had, um, and so it was, it was just a blessing to see, to, to wait for the, the messages every night, and to see, you know, just all the awesome things that God was doing, and and, uh, you know, we, we survived. I had both kids with a lot of help with the grandmas. We made it through the week, and uh, the house is still up, and they even had clean clothes when Jaron got back home on uh, Friday night. So I'm calling that a victory in my book. So, um, but man, we're proud of them. And in fact, um, next week, Kelly's going to have just some video from, from their experience and some of their, their testimonies. And um, with the help of Tyler, and that's going to be really, really powerful. I can't wait to see that, so make sure that you're here next week. Um, but I'm so proud of them for, for really just taking the gospel out and, and making disciples, and I honestly, truthfully believe we can learn from these youth. I learn something from them every single week, and, and I'm not just saying that. There is a wisdom there and a fire and a passion there that is so incredibly exciting. Um, so if you will, go ahead and open up your Bibles to me, for me, uh, to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Now I know Brent has said this before, and I would say the same thing. Uh, if I had one desire for LifePoint's body, if it's church body, it would be that, that we would do whatever it takes to spread the gospel. Out of Chillicothe, out of our community, into other areas, all the way to the corners of the world. 
And as a Christian, that's, that's kind of what we've been asked to do. That's what we've been called to do. Most of you have probably heard of the story of a guy named Jim Elliott. On October 28, 1949, he was writing in his journal, and he wrote something that, you know, has been kind of a rallying cry for the Christian church for years and years. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Now, he didn't know when he wrote that, that just a few short years later in January of 1956, that, that he would actually experience a really violent death trying to spread the gospel uh, to uh, a an, an native people tr- tribe uh, called the Huarani tribe in Ecuador, along with uh, some fellow missionaries, Ed McCulley, Roger Eudorian, Pete Fleming, and their pilot, Nate Saint. And most of you probably know his story. You know about his death. You probably, you may know about his wife, Elizabeth Elliot, and her impact on missions. But what makes this story so powerful isn't just that quote. And it's not just that he died, because obviously to, to write something like that, he's, he's already died to himself, you know, long before that actually happened. And it's not just that God used that story to propel and advance the gospel. The, the real powerful thing I believe in that story, the message of Christ's love will not stop. It cannot be killed. Because these men's families, what they decided to do is they packed up and they moved into that same indigenous people group. And they loved them. And they shared the gospel with them. And those people, eventually, their lives were transformed by Christ. And what I think is the most beautiful picture of this whole thing, the daughter of Nate Saint, whose father was the the pilot on that trip when they they landed on that sandbar to reach these people, and and he he was brutally murdered along with the others. And, you know, the only way that they could identify these men was by their personal effects. That gives you an idea of just how awful this was. But after many years of living among this, this Warani tribe, his daughter accepted Christ, and was baptized by some of the same men who actually murdered her father in the same spot in the river where he died. There is no better picture of redeeming grace. As human beings, we're not, we're not capable of that kind of love. That can only come from one place. That can only be seen in one place, and that's, that's through Jesus and through his sacrifice for us and the story of the gospel. The gospel will always triumph. The gospel will always win. So we're going to be reading in Philippians, and and Paul's been arrested for for agitating Jews. Remember, Paul was one of the fiercest persecutors of Jews. In fact, um, if you'll remember a few weeks ago, Kelly talked about the stoning of Stephen, one of the first martyrs, and Paul was was actually there. He He was absolutely opposed to the Jews. Um, and that was before Christ got a hold of him. And now, as, you, as we read this in Philippians, it's good to remember that um, the gospel, you know, again, it cannot be killed. And that's what he's going to be talking about here. How many of you would actually like to hear some good news today? How, do you feel like sometimes there's just nothing, but do you just dread turning on the TV? I know that's the way I feel lately. I figured, you know, we need to hear some good news, and we've got the best news of all, and I want to kind of talk to you about that. In Philippians 12, Paul writes, and he's, he's literally in chains. Verse 12, if you'll follow along, chapter 1, verse 12. And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. It's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I've been appointed to defend the good news. Those others who do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ, they preach with selfish ambition, not sincerity, intending to make my chains more painful to me. But that doesn't matter. 
whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ. Um, they preach of selfish, but that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that as you pray for me, and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past, and I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or die. For to me, for, for to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me, but for your sakes, it's better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I'm convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. And when I come to you again, you will have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because of what he is doing through me. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then, whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they're going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved, even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. Now, really, really long passage, a lot to digest there, but what this is, guys, what Paul is saying here is a rallying cry for us, and a rallying cry even for LifePoint Church. What I want to share with you today is there are four main reasons why the gospel is unkillable. And then a, a fifth point of how do we respond to that? So if you look in your outline to point number one, the first reason the gospel is unkillable, and this seems really, really self-explanatory, but God is always in control. God is always in control. Now, we know that, and we can kind of rationalize that, but kind of like I talked to you before, when we turn on the news and we see things, do we sometimes find ourselves having trouble and struggling with that truth. I know that I sometimes do, and I have to remind myself. The church of Philippi, the church that Paul is writing to here, he deeply loves them. He doesn't have anything bad to say about them. Other churches he writes to, he's like, hey, I like that you're doing this, but, okay, the church of Philippi, he doesn't have that to say. He says, you know, you guys are doing awesome. <clears throat> he's, been, he's been put in jail for agitating the Jewish community. He's been preaching the message of Christ. In verse 12, he says, I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that's happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows I'm in chains because of Christ. And that because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. He says, even though that I'm in prison for the sake of the gospel— even though that I'm here, that I'm in chains, that being here, being in this place confined has actually been like fuel put on the gospel, a gospel fire. How many of you like to grill a barbecue, you know, charcoal, you know, you love putting all that lighter fluid on there, throwing the match on, boom, okay? Paul being in prison has actually been like that explosion. His imprisonment has actually resulted in the advance of the gospel. So not only have people heard the gospel that, you know, wouldn't have normally, you know, heard it, but really, really important people in the Roman world have been talking to Paul because of the fact that he's in chains and he's, he's in, fr in front of them. If you're chained next to a guy, a Roman guard for 24 hours a day, what do you think Paul probably talked to him about? Probably got, you know, that guard probably got tired of hearing it. But he's writing this letter actually in chains. And, and we're probably not really understanding just how brutal this imprisonment was. You know, I think it's easy for us to go, oh, yeah, okay, he was in chains. You know, he was a prisoner. You know, a prisoner of the Roman Republic in the first century, you know, think about this. You cannot eat. You cannot sleep. You cannot use the restroom. 
without permission from someone. He was probably mocked. He was probably tormented. They probably, you know, beat him regularly. But he doesn't complain once. If you look through this entire thing, he has no complaints whatsoever. And that's because God can often use pain. He can often use difficulty to help propel the gospel message. Now, how can we prepare for that? How can we prepare for the pain in our lives that God may use to help propel the gospel message? We've got to be vigilant. The enemy can attack us, and the gospel's always going to be despised by Satan. Don't, don't kid yourself about that. The fact that we're meeting here today, the fact that we're proclaiming God's word, the enemy absolutely despises that. Okay? He and his, his minions would love nothing more than to kill any advance of the gospel. Because when they see the gospel flourishing and growing, it's just a, a foretaste to them of what's eventually going to come when Christ you know, casts them into the lake of fire. It shows their destruction. It gives them an idea of what's coming. So Paul says, in, in, um, in spite of the attacks, the gospel can't be killed. So in 2 Corinthians, in another, his letter to the Corinthians, Paul at another time says, This is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weakness. I delight in insults. I delight in hardship. I delight in persecution. I delight in difficulties. For when I am weak, I am strong. How many of us delight in trials, hardship, persecution? It's a really, really tough thing to try to grasp. But we have to remember we don't get to kind of play this whole woe is me, you know, viewpoint in theology. We've got to remember, God will triumph in the end. We can't really whine about our suffering. It does nothing to really further his kingdom. We've got to recognize that, guys, this earth, this place, this world really isn't our home. We don't really have, you know, any promises that it's going to be a, a, a wonderful, smooth, you know, beautiful ride all the time here on this earth. When we stand and glorify Christ while we're being under, while we're under attack, we show the enemy that their time is limited and that their destruction is coming. So let me ask you this. When was the last time you actually boasted in your weakness so that he could be glorified? Number two, um, the gospel thrives under difficult circumstances. Every time the gospel is actually under assault and under threat, it advances. When you look back in history, the worst times for Christians, when they receive the most pain, the most persecution, the most difficulty, that's when the church kind of explodes and blows up and, and moves forward. Today, many of us feel like we, we kind of whine. We think we're under attack, especially here in America. But the good news is we're actually not really being persecuted all that much, you know, in comparison to the rest of the world. The fact that we can actually be in this room today and openly proclaim his word freely is a blessing that I know that I have taken for granted before. We haven't really chased true suffering like others in the world. Um, I love to go on mission trips, and, and I've gone several times to, to the Philippines, and I've met people there who literally, accepting Christ, choosing to follow him, has meant that they're ostracized from their family, that they have lost their homes, their loved ones, <clears throat> and they're, they're, they're kicked out of the community, and sometimes even worse. And it's not just there. It's everywhere in the world. We haven't had to pay a truly dear price for following Christ the way others have. But when we see the status of, our, in, of things in the world, sometimes it's really easy to get discouraged. It's easy to get angry. But we're really not accomplishing anything through that anger by burying our head in the sand, becoming bitter and hopeless. The fact is that when, when that adversity comes in, we've got to shine Christ's light even stronger into a world that's even more dark. And in fact, when this world becomes darker and, it, and things get more bleak, a true, genuine act of love, a true, genuine act of following Christ is going to illuminate things even more. It's going to stand out even more. It's going to speak volumes. You know, I, I saw an example of that this week when it was 100 degrees outside on a Wednesday night, and there are people working together in unity and sweating and not complaining and, and, and going out into the community and showing people that, you know, 
it's miserable out here, but this is our ministry. This is our community. We love Christ, and we want you to see it too. That's a true message of Jesus, of what of wanting to proclaim his word. In verse 14, God uses Paul's imprisonment to, to strengthen the church and the body of believers. Most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. Now, the truth is, the church is actually changing in America, okay? This is true. We can't deny that. Our nation is changing. But let me ask you this. Have you ever considered that this could all be a part of God's plan? Do you believe that he's still sovereign and in control? A, a friend of mine and my former pastor, Micah Fries, actually worked for Lifeway and did a lot of statistical analysis of the church and the changing church. And I borrowed a lot of this, this message from him with his permission. But he said, you know, most of the people who are leaving the church in droves are actually what we would call nominal Christians. And that's a word that means they're Christians in name only. Okay? They, they haven't truly experienced Christ. They, they, they have a church affiliation, but they don't actually live it. And could it be that, that Christians who say they're Christians but don't actually live it are actually doing more to harm the gospel than, than to propel it? Could it be that he's kind of fortifying his people here. There's actually a, a growth in evangelical, robust, Bible-believing Christians, and that's something to be excited about in our nation. People who claim to be Christians but don't actually live it out, you know, aren't Christians. I can claim that I'm a Kansas City Royal, but that doesn't make it so, okay? I'm still waiting on my ring. I haven't received it yet, okay? You can claim a lot of things, but if there's no evidence to support it, it's not truth. Could it be that God is thinning out his church in preparation for something that's truly incredible? And, and history really shows us that that's a possibility. There are very few times when, when things are really good, peace and prosperity, and, and, and times are good when, when God's kingdom is actually propelled. So just maybe God's going to use the assault on Christianity today to produce something incredible, and that's my prayer. So point number one was God is control, in control. Point number two was the gospel thrives under difficult circumstances. Point number three is there's always going to be opposition to the gospel. Lots of people didn't like Paul. Lots of people, okay? And lots of people preached for different reasons. They preached out of envy. They preached out of pride. They preached out of rivalry. But Paul says, I don't care just as long as it's getting preached. It's not about me. That's an important thing that we have to tell ourselves sometimes. It's not about me. Can we say that? I don't care what others say about me as long as his message is prospering. There can be lonely times when you step out in faith. Some of you have experienced that. When you really honestly let God take charge of your life, there can be lonely times. But we've got to know that his promise is that he's going to take bad circumstances, moments, trials, and use them to advance his gospel. In fact, it was a year ago today that Jaron and I stood up here and, and told a little bit about our story. And if it weren't for a really, really awful, terrible experience that happened to us several years ago, you know, I don't know that I'd be standing here. He used that difficult circumstance, that trial, to make me reaffirm my faith. We don't have God's perspective on our circumstances. We can't see how the difficult chapters in our book impact the unbelievable conclusion. I teach English at the high school for a living. I teach books a lot. And guys, I've never found a book that doesn't have chapters where bad things happen. <laughs> it doesn't make for a very good story, right? Sometimes we have to look at those chapters and look at the whole picture and where that leads to, and our lives are the exact same way. Look at the way Paul handles the adversity he's facing. He is so incredibly positive. In verse 18 through 21, verse 18, he says, I'm going to rejoice in verse 19, he says, this will lead to my deliverance. In verse 19, he says, I'm getting help from the Spirit of Jesus. In verse 20, I'm not ashamed about anything. Verse 20, Christ will be honored whether I live or die. And he's talking about being beaten and put into jail. 
And absolutely no threat is so big that it's able to triumph over the gospel. In 1956, these men, these indigenous people, thought they were ending the threat of these foreigners. They thought, it's done, it's over, it's finished. They won't be back, and we can continue on with our lives. But it wasn't the end. It was just the beginning of what God had planned. Of the, of the, 11, the 12 disciples, obviously Judas betrayed Christ. But did you know that 10 out of the 11 remaining disciples were actually martyred? Meaning they gave their lives for their faith. In fact, Peter requested to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel he was worthy of dying in the same way Christ did. And John, the one guy who did survive, was exiled to an island to live and die alone. Every time one of them was removed, five, ten, a hundred would pop up in their place. And we have to kind of be wary of this prosperity gospel where, you know, it tells us that everything's, you know, just a matter of faith and things will always work out wonderfully. Can I tell you, you don't really want your best life now, okay? You don't want your best life now. You want your best life in eternity, okay? If it was okay for the disciples to suffer, why do we expect any differently? The leaders then wanted to snuff out the gospel. They wanted to kill it in its infancy, and it started with Jesus. He was a rebel. He was a threat to the establishment. He said things that other people, you know, despised. And so they thought, we'll get rid of this threat. And so they took those nine-inch long nails, and they drove them through his wrists and through his feet, and they, they jabbed the two-inch thorns into his head and as the blood trickled down on his face and his shredded back hung from that, that cat of nine tails whip and they, they put him up on that cross and they mocked him and you know in a first century Roman kind of way they were rejoicing in the fact that they said it's done it's finished we took care of it we don't have to deal with that anymore wouldn't you have loved to see their faces as the ground shook and darkness came over and the veil was torn, and Jesus killed death once and for all, and he rose three days later. You can try to kill the gospel, but it cannot be killed. And it could be that maybe God is preparing this place for another great movement of his spirit. So our final point, point number four, the gospel is much bigger than you or me. Paul actually wants to go home. He's disappointed that he's, and by home I mean he wants to go be with Jesus. He's actually disappointed he's got more work to do. In verse 23 he says, I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes it's better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I'm convinced I will remain alive so that I continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. He makes sacrifices for the sake of his fellow believers. He takes responsibility for their well-being. Guys, can I tell you that your leaders are actually deeply flawed, sinful people, especially me, okay? We're just, we're just people, we're just human beings, but, but in God's economy, God has chosen you and he's chosen me, these flawed people, to help advance the gospel. Uh, a quote that I, I, I read that I think is really great is that all of man's work is actually God's work through man. By the grace of God alone, you know, we hold people in the Bible up on a pedestal. But if you look at the people in the Bible, did God use any perfect people to really do anything other than Christ? If, if you look back, and I'm sure you've heard this before, Noah was a drunk, Abraham was too old, Isaac was a daydreamer, Jacob was a liar, Leah was ugly, Joseph was abused, Moses had a stuttering problem, Gideon was afraid, Samson had long hair and was a womanizer, Rahab was a prostitute, Jeremiah was too young, David was an adulterer, not to mention a murderer, Elijah was suicidal, Jonah ran from God, Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs. Andrew lived in the shadow of his big brother. Peter denied Christ. All the disciples fell asleep while praying and ran away when Jesus really needed them. Martha worried about everything. The Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. Mary Magdalene was demon-possessed. Zacchaeus was too small. Timothy had an ulcer. Paul was a Christian killer. Oh, and Lazarus, Lazarus was dead. Did we cover every excuse that maybe we have of why we can't serve God and why he can't use us? 
Guys, the gospel is unkillable. I'd like to have the praise team come on up if they would. So what should we do? What can we do in response to this? The number one thing that we can do is we can stand together and fight for the gospel, to be unified as a church body, to advance it from this place. Verse 27, Paul says, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news of Christ. This is the verse that's in your bulletin, the key verse here. Then whether I come and see you again or I only hear about you, I will know that you're standing together with one spirit, one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. There are lots of things in this world that we look at as measuring sticks. But can I tell you, your job is not your measuring stick. Your family name is not your measuring stick. What part of town you live in is not the measuring stick. Your status in the community is not the measuring stick. Your church affiliation is not the measuring stick. We share one common measurement standard, measuring standard, and that is the gospel. So Paul says we need to stand in unity, which is not easy to do. Most of the reasons that we become disunified are actually bogus. We have personality issues, petty disagreements. We argue about things like the color of carpet in the sanctuary. We're going to stand accountable for that one day if we destroy the church over things that really don't matter. Paul says that we have to labor together. He says, I beat my body to bring it under control. Jesus says in Luke 9 that we deny ourselves and take up our cross. And that's what I encourage each and every one of us to do, that we would deny ourselves, that we would proudly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. As a church, we must do everything together with a singular question. Not, does it make us more comfortable? Not, does it make sense to the outside world? But does it further the gospel in Chillicothe, Missouri? and outward. Are we creating disciples? Our suffering is for his sake. Remember the key verse, don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This is going to be a sign to them that they're going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved even by God himself. The enemy's day is drawing to a close, guys. The gospel is at the heart of everything that we as followers of Christ believe. Not only is the gospel the good news of how we're made right with God, and some of you may, you know, maybe you don't know, what, what does he mean? What is the gospel? It's not just the good news that how we can be made right with God. It's the good news about how we can walk in a relationship with him every day absolutely everything begins with the gospel. It's the story of Jesus, who is our only hope. Everything we do revolves around the gospel. So what is the gospel? In short, it's the story of God and man. Man was created in God's image. Man disobeyed God. In the beginning, he was separated from God. And every human born since the very first couple, Adam and Eve, are guilty of disobeying as well. And that includes you, and that includes me. But God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to stand in our place. He lived a perfect life when we couldn't, and he died when we should have. And when we trust him as our savior and we surrender our lives to him as our king, we're reconciled with God. We're adopted into his family and our eternity with him is secured forever. So the gospel isn't just a list of behaviors. It's not a requirement of anything that we need to do. It's already been done on our behalf. It is the good news about what God has done for us. To follow Christ, we don't have to do anything. We simply need to believe in the truth of his gospel. Will you bow your heads with me, please? God, we, just, we lift up our struggles. And we lift up our trials to you. And we, we recognize that you have the power and the authority to make all things work together for good. 
We give you our human weaknesses. We give you our limitations. We give you our, our shortcomings. We ask that you would use those for your glory. We pray that for our world that we live in, that we would be moving closer to your deliverance. We pray that this fallen world would turn back to you. But until that day, I lift up this church that we would be motivated by one thing, and that is to advance your gospel at any cost. Father, if there's anyone here today who doesn't know you, who doesn't know the peace that comes from that relationship with you and that you have paid it all for them. My prayer for you is that, and for them is that you would recognize that not only will the gospel win, but that it can conquer anything in their lives. If you're here today and that's you, I pray that you would stop trying to fill the emptiness in your life with just the worldly things. Father, we just thank you. We pray for this church body. We pray that the gospel would be proclaimed in this place. And it's in Jesus' name I pray.